Good morning, colleagues, and the one online. Apology for the delay. I just want to welcome you all, the colleagues uh, who are online. Uh, with such you are. So welcome and I to apologize to our partner and our key speaker, Dr. Kate Davis, who's going to be sharing with us with regards to how they manage their statistical database in Australia. Dr. Carl Davis, Kate Davis is an administrator, librarian, information researcher, and former library and information educator. In her current role as the director, strategy and analytics for the Council of Australian University Librarians, Carl, she works with senior leaders and practitioners in academic libraries across Australia and New Zealand to implement programs of strategic initiatives and oversees both the call analytics service and professional learning service. Kate is an experienced administrator and project manager with a background in leading university-wide consultation processes, coordinating university policy and framework development and designing processes and workflows to support collaborative development of online learning experiences. Kate is an interdisciplinary human experience. Kate is an interdisciplinary human experience researcher with expertise in qualitative methodologies and interest in social media research. Dr. Ntavisen, you have a partner there. Information research, particularly in the context of social media and scholarship of teaching and learning. Dr. Dr. Kate Davis, thank you very much for accepting the invite. And I would like to also acknowledge Professor Chiware for ensuring that this uh, session takes place. Thank you very much. And we're all waiting to, uh, to hear what you have to share with us. Thank you. I wanted to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of uh, the country on which I live and work here in Southeast Queensland, Australia. Um, they are the Yugambeh people. And I'd like to acknowledge their ancestors their ancestors and their um, their uh, emerging leaders um, and to acknowledge their deep and spiritual connection to country. So thanks very much for having me along um, this morning for you tonight for me at 7.30 here. Um, I'm pleased to speak to you this evening about the call analytics service uh, and the different aspects of the analytics service. Um, and I just wanted to give you a tiny bit of background about call first of all. So CALL is the peak leadership body for university librarians in Australia and New Zealand. And we have 47 members who are the directors or university librarians of um, the uh, universities 38 in um, Australia, 39 in Australia and um, eight in New Zealand. Uh, we run an, an analytics service for the for both countries and have done for a very long time. So call statistics have been collected since 1953. Until uh, 2008, they were published in a print version um, when uh, an online database was developed. Um, for a period of about 20 years, uh, oh, sorry, it's actually it's more like 30 years, um, Another a company uh, in Australia called Caval, who uh, do library technology work, actually managed the collection um, of the statistics um, and the pre presentation of the statistics for us. For us. Um, so uh, we do have an audio loop, so perhaps could we mute the microphone in the main room? Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so that, that process was managed for us. And I joined Call in 2021 as a director of strategy and analytics. And it's a big portfolio. I would say uh, in a good week, I spend 20% of my time managing the analytics service and the rest of my time on strategy, managing communities of practice, events, and professional learning. Um, but in 2021, when I first joined, we undertook a review of the call analytics service and we made the decision to bring the data collection, um, data management and data presentation process uh, processes in house at call. So last year was the first year that we have managed that data collection uh, process in house. It went um, pretty successfully, I think. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is talk you through um, 
I guess, the kind of setup that we have in place behind the scenes uh, for our statistics, uh, walk you through what the data collection process looks like, and then show you uh, what is collected at the other end. Um, and I'd also like to share with you a few lessons that I've learned in the last two years uh, managing this service about collecting um, primarily quantitative data, benchmarking data for the sector, um, and just some, uh, I guess, tips or advice as you move forward. Now, I am going to share my entire screen with you because I want to jump backwards and forwards between slides and some live presentations. So just bear with me as I do that um, so I can make sure we can all see everything. Okay, so on the screen in front of me now, I have um, a depiction of what I call our analytics stack. And this is our analytics environment that we developed in late 2021, early 2022. So previously when our data collection and management was managed by an external company, um, they ran a uh, bespoke database that had evolved over time. And as bespoke data databases uh, want to do, um, it had become a little bit of a Frankenstein in terms of the way it was set up because um, the elements, the statistics elements had changed over time. And there were some particular decisions that were made about how those elements would be mapped or not mapped over time. So when we started looking at how we would set this up in-house, we had a number of constraints. And, and one of those constraints for us is that we're an office of seven people. Um, we have an executive director, we have a director of content procurement, we have myself as a director. We now have an associate director who works in the space of um, open access, read and publish agreements primarily. And he's now pr providing some support to me with uh, the data as well. Um, a particular aspect of the data that I'll talk about later. Um, we have an administration officer, a finance officer. We have someone two days a week now who works on an open textbook project, um, but we're a very small office. We have no in-house IT support um, and we have limited capacity. As was mentioned in my introduction, I am a qualitative researcher um, by trade and training. <clears throat> so quantitative data is not my, um, my original wheelhouse, although I have developed quite the fondness for it in this job, which is very necessary. Um, but, you know, my SQL skills, my database management skills are fairly um, uh, basic. And we also don't have the support to run servers or um, to be doing custom builds of databases and front ends for those databases. So we hired some consultants to work with us on this project and they were invaluable. It's a company called Interworks, they're an international company um, who really gave us some great advice and did a lot of field work for us. And, you know, we set out wanting to develop something um, similar to what we previous had, previously had with a single front end where people could log in and put their statistics in that would automatically populate the database and then be presented back to people um, through a web interface, which is what we had before. What we soon discovered though, was that um, building the front end in particular was going to be an extremely expensive endeavor, um, both initially in terms of the initial setup and then in terms of ongoing maintenance. Um, and so we made some pragmatic decisions about what our stack would look like. And I'm quite happy with what we've ended up with and it seems to be functioning quite well and it's proven to be um, scalable and ex um, extensible as well. So what we do is we use a front-end data entry tool called Formsight. It's essentially a custom form builder that allows you to build custom um, and quite complex forms, um, not dissimilar to a survey tool, but um, it allows us to get data out in specific ways. In the middle, we have our data warehouse, which is Snowflake. Um, and we have uh, the statistics sit there in two databases, which I'll explain in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, and then on the front end, what our users see when they're interacting with the published statistics is a Tableau Online instance or call. Now, what joins all this up is Tableau Prep. Now, we could have used um, other uh, ETL or Extract, Transform and Load tools that probably would have been um, in the longer term, uh, I guess, probably more flexible and more um, fit for purpose, but we wanted to go with a simple tool that we could use in-house and um, edit in-house and not have um, lots and lots of software costs 
um, lots of licensing costs and also um, have to have special um, skills to work with. So we use Tableau Prep to take the data that we get from Formsight and ingest that into Snowflake. And then we use Tableau Prep to take the data um, that we get um, from, sorry, we use Tableau uh, to take the data that we get from Snowflake and move it across into Tableau Online. Now we made a, a bunch of pragmatic decisions about costs as well. One of them, as I mentioned, was going with Tableau Prep in, as a our ETL, our, um, our talking piece that allows us to extract and transform data. Um, we could have gone with a more expensive tool, but it's serving us very well, um, both in this application and in our other statistics application that I'll talk about shortly. We also um, choose to not have a live connection between Tableau Online and Snowflake. And this is something that saves us um, quite a lot of money. Um, so it might seem like a trivial cost when you're having a, um, a connection back to Snowflake to pull data across. Uh, but over time, depending on how much people are using it, you really don't want people going in and querying in Tableau Online um, and then pulling data from, dynamically from Snowflake every time they're using it. So instead we work off an extract that gets refreshed um, once a month for the data. Now, when we look at the statistics databases in particular, I mentioned before that we have a pre-2018 and a post-2018 database. Um, the reason for this is that in 2018, substantial changes were made to the core statistics elements. And the decision was taken at the time not to map the uh, pieces of data or the elements that were collected in the past to the new elements. Instead, they hived off and created a new database and started collecting the data separately. Now what this meant in practice was we had this fairly rudimentary interface where people could log in and download the data, but they could never get the 2018 um, pre and post data together. They could never see in the very basic diagrams, they could never see any of those longitudinal trends, um, which of course is the beauty of having a data set as old as ours. So within Snowflake, in our data, database setup, we have three kind of main database areas. We have the staging, um, where it's split into pre-2018 and post-2018. Now, this is where the data goes, or the first lot of data when we took it all from our provider and, um, and uploaded it to Snowflake, that's where it's at. And in the two, 2018 post-database, that's where our new data goes every time we do a data load each year. Then we have an integration database where we do some transformation on the data. And what we're doing here is starting to bring together the pre and post 2018 data sets. And then we have a whole lot more transformations we do um, between the integration and the presentation layer, um, where we uh, really finally kind of solidify those connections between the 2018 and um, pre and post data sets. Um, we do things like currency conversions because, of course, we're working across two countries, so we need to make sure that there's um, um, comparability across the currencies um, and a whole range of other things. So that's kind of the basic setup on that end. Um, I thought I might just show you um, a couple of other things uh, around the process. The first one is this is the form site form builder tool that we use to capture um, the statistics and I'll give you a look at the 2022 um, statistics interface. It's nothing super fancy, it's very basic um, and so what we, we do is our members all have an account per institution and they input their data here. Now I'm just going to use my same institution I always use um, and we ask them to confirm these details as well just so we know everything is all linked up and who's doing the data collection. Then our data collection is split up into different sections and we start out with what is undoubtedly the most important um, information for our members and that is around expenditure on information resources. Uh, a lot of them use this for benchmarking purposes and to get increases in their budgets approved and those kinds of things. And for each element um, within each section, we have the element name, we have the definition of the element, there's a space for them to enter in their, um, their value or their statistic for this year. We then provide a range of value options. Um, for example, they can select exact figure, estimate. Uh, if they can't provide it, um, we get them to tick can't provide, so we know they haven't just left a blank field. 
um, if it's not applicable, there's very few elements that anybody ever ticks not applicable on. Then something else they can do is also enter in notes. Now, these notes tend to be uh, things like there's a discrepancy this year because we paid this big invoice at this other time or, you know, those kinds of um, those kinds of things. One of the pointers I would um, suggest is if you were setting up this kind of thing, I would uh, try to avoid having things like value options and I would try to make sure that the definitions for the statistics elements are sufficiently tight that people don't need to provide notes um, to a company uh, any of their details because they just are very difficult to present in a front end um, and they tend to get lost and we know that people don't really look at that level of detail they're just looking at the numbers. So our members um, will go through and they'll complete this for all of the elements and submit it at the end of the process. In terms of what our elements are, um, we maintain a definitions database uh, that sits in Airtable and is linked from our website. Now, of course, those definitions are here on the form, but um, being librarians, our members are planners and they like to work ahead. So they do things like um, they'll prepare for their data collection before we open the collection. And so it's important for them to have this information. Um, you'll see here that the element um, the element names are here and then there are gr the groupings that they sit in. We also have a data source field provided here um, and the reason we do that is because um, anything that's a sum again. field we don't get the members yes, to provide, we uh, sum those ourselves oh, okay, cool. um, just to reduce the burden on them for data entry so um, and the other side. reason for that is I'm we hearing collect you. population I'm not hearing data uh, but that comes from our no, Department of Education Okay, perfect. Um, so the data around um, number of students uh, and the data around number of staff employed at the university and um, that actually comes from government data so they know they don't need to put that in. Most of our elements are mandatory. There are some optional elements. The majority of those optional elements relate to staff um, pay levels uh, and so some institutions will elect to put this information in and others um, won't. I think this is something that needs review because um, unless you've got a critical mass of the data there's really not a great deal of point to having it and so it's work for those people who provide it and they don't necessarily um, get the benefit back from that. Um, then we have the definitions. Something that I've added this year is um, now that I've run this more than once I'm starting to see the same um, sorts of questions emerge about the elements. Um, and so, for example, someone will email me and say, I can't get the B3 counter report um, for, uh, for Books Digital, um, can I use B1? Um, and so uh, the standard answer that I give people to that instead of them now having to email me is here on this page. And the other important piece of work that we did as part of the process of um, moving our database across to uh, Paul's environment and setting up our new analytics stack um, was mapping to the elements um, that existed pre-2018. So we have now provided that previously known as information in a, a bit more of a succinct way than we did in the past, um, where there is a direct correlation with an element. Um, now that's an important point because some of these are direct correlations, but very few of them are. There have been little tweaks and changes to the definitions that means that um, when we did that work to unify the two databases we couldn't have there wasn't necessarily like for like so we had to do a bit of interpretation of um, you know it might have been two of the old elements together now equal a new one or um, something like that and so we had to do a lot of work around that as well. So when the data comes in from uh, into form site, we do a download of the data in Excel and then we do some basic Excel transformations. Um, those transformations uh, relate to the fact that um, we're working with an SQL database and so we have um, IDs attached to all of these elements and so we do some replacing of element names with ID numbers and then we use Tableau Prep to ingest that data. Now I'll show you a Tableau Prep 
workflow, but I won't show you that exact one because I don't have that to hand, but let me give you a quick look at what a Tableau prep workflow looks like. So this is one I'll show you in a moment related to another part of the analytics service, but essentially we'll grab the spreadsheet here and then we'll run it through the transformations, which for the most part involves kind of pivoting um, the data uh, around and then it gets ingested straight through to the Snowflake database. Once it's in Snowflake, um, then it's uh, ready to have our extract refresh in Tableau for our users to be able to access the data. And let me show you what it looks like to them. Sorry, apologies, it's sending my phone an authenticator message and I'm on do not disturb, so wait a second. Okay, um, I've got a bit more visible in my um, dashboard because I'm an administrator than our users do, but the two primary folders that our users work with are member content, which is where our statistics sits, and our read and publish reporting, um, which I'll show you in a moment. So in terms of the statistics, there's two main dashboards. The first one is the consolidated data set. And this is um, that data set, that unified pre and post 2018 data set and where they can view all um, data moving forward. So um, it's very easy to work with. Um, at the moment, I've got it set to uh, 2010 to 2021, but we can go back um, back, all the way back to 1994, um, it does get a bit hit and miss further back because institution names have changed over time and the elements have changed. But um, I find that, you know, 10 years is a pretty good range um, to have a look at. So let's look at that. And there's a bunch of selectors that people can use. Some institutions use this as their kind of central repository for the data for themselves. They may not maintain their own, so they might just uh, want to come in here and, and look at their own institution's data. We have what we call subsectors in Australia, types of institutions. So we have the group of eight um, institutions, which is the big sandstone, traditional, old, been around forever, um, research intensive institutions. So we can limit to, um, to those. Um, and then we also have regions. Um, the regions is a bit tricky because uh, we do have some institutions that exist across multiple states. And so um, they, that makes it a bit difficult to deal with them. Put this back to all. So what we've done in matching up the two databases is wherever possible, we have um, provided the current name for um, an element. And then we have, uh, which sits under element. And then we have got the source elements for that. So for example, um, if I was to, I'm actually gonna just reduce to one institution. So we've got a bit more on screen, maybe not that one. Um, actually this one, okay. So this is um, the Australian National University and we can see here, um, this is the library clients population grouping, and I'm going to limit to um, population uh, non-institutional users. Okay, so we can see that the element is currently called population non-institutional users, but if I expand this, you can see that over time it's had other names. So from um, 2011 to 2017, there were two elements, population other users and population ULANs and users from other universities. And those two elements together are equal to our current element population non-institutional users. So you can see how those have mapped um, over time. So this is where our um, members can come and download the data. Each member institution gets one license to use Tableau uh, included in their membership, and then they can add on additional licenses. Currently that's at a cost of 165 US dollars per license. Um, and they can just simply download the data that, that they can filter for the data thereafter and then download it by downloading across tabulation off the top here. Now, what we'd like to do more of in the future, now that we have this beautiful longitudinal data set where we can um, finally see the data um, over this vast period of time is more of these 
um, analytical dashboards that provide people with insights into the data. Now, um, this is one of the areas that people are most interested in, and that is expenditure on scholarly content. Um, and this particular dashboard um, tracks from 2004 to, to 2021, which is the most recent data we've got um, in the system. And it shows how patterns of expenditure have changed over time. Um, it shows the print, uh, which is the light blue versus the electronic, which is the dark blue and the total expenditure. Now we can look at this per institution or we can look at it per sector, um, but it's a very interesting graph and it shows us that um, good old COVID uh, in um, 2020 really marked a turning point for budgets in collection in collections where for the first time we saw a downturn in expenditure. And part of that was um, my counterpart negotiated, um, uh, my counterpart, the director of content procurement negotiated some very good deals on content that year, but also budgets just tightening. And you can see as well that um, print collections have really um, significantly dropped off. The graph at the bottom tells us the, um, the percentage change year on year um, in those different uh, expenditure areas. So we'd love to do more of this, but as I said, um, unfortunately, I probably, yes, in a good week, spend about 20% of my time on, um, on this. And a good proportion of that time that I spend is actually spent on our other major analytics product that isn't our call statistics. Um, and that is our read and publish reporting, which I will show you a little, uh, a little bit of now, but rather quickly. All right. So, um, Call and negotiates uh, content procurement deals for the sector. Um, and uh, in the last several years, a big focus of that has been transitioning as many of our agreements to read and publish or transformative agreements as possible um, using existing uh, read expenditure. So no additional expenditure for libraries um, and uh, transitioning those to, so that um, academics in institutions can publish APC free. Um, our members have a voracious desire for data in this space and very unfortunately, particularly for me, um, there is no standard for the format in which this data is supplied from publishers um, and it can be very difficult to work with. There's a lot of nuance in it um, that needs, you, there's a lot of understanding that you need to have of how the various publishers do the reporting. And so last year, the call board made a strategic investment in um, developing a set of dashboards for republished reporting. Um, and now we routinely ingest the data from publishers um, to present back to our users. Now I'm showing you screenshots here because these databases contain commercial, uh, so these dashboards contain commercial incompetence information. Um, and so I've got some of that blanked out. Let me just whip through and show you what this looks like. So each institution gets this view. Um, so we have two sets of dashboards. One is for current year um, versus previous year. And that really focuses in on allowing institutions to see what's happening right now compared to last year. There's also this dashboard, which is a single year overview, which is really about historical views of the data. So this is the single year overview for one of our institutions in 2022. Um, and you can see the bits I've got blacked out here. Um, what we wanted to do with this is design a dashboard where our members could just print it and send it straight up the line at their university to report on how um, the APCs were being uh, uh, avoided or used at their institution. So we include the institution's expenditure on these agreements here. So it's all on the page for them. Um, and that's why I can't show you this live. And we also highlight um, how much have they avoided in terms of APCs um, year to date. So um, we will calculate based on the APC list prices, um, how many articles have been published and um, uh, multiply that by the APC list prices. And then we can say, okay, your institution has avoided $2 million in APCs. So this is the historical view. Um, and this is the current view. This is from much earlier this year. So there's not that much data in there at this point. Um, this uh, updates as frequently as we can manage um, in terms of both how quickly the publishers send us the data, how clean the data is and how much time I have to ingest it, although uh, this process is being handed over to a colleague who uh, will hopefully be faster than me 
Um, so the dashboard presents the basics um, in terms of here's your graph of where you're sitting. It then gives you a breakdown by publisher of how many articles. Um, you can toggle up the top from articles to APCs and these numbers turn into dollar values instead. It also breaks down the article types, again, can be seen by dollar values. It will show us the licenses that are applied to the articles that have been published, as well as the highest level fields of research codes. Um, FOR codes in Australia are the codes that research are assigned to for um, assessment purposes by the government. Um, and these just give uh, a really high level indication of where the publishing um, in the agreements is happening. We also provide a current status. Um, uh, six of our agreements are actually capped um, and uh, or capped at less than 100% of last year's publishing. And so we provide an update here for members on how many articles are actually published um, uh, have been published and how much of the cap is exceeded at any given time. Also in the um, comparative year on year, um, we provide uh, this view that allows them to select institutions and compare. So that's helpful um, for them to choose the institutions that they typically benchmark with. Uh, and then we provide um, this view as well, which gives just a little bit more granularity. Finally, we have a metadata Christine, download that me? allows the institutions to download um, any subset of the metadata, testing, um, including testing. their data, data for institutions that they compare to, uh, and so forth, so that they can um, do their own manipulation of the data locally. Mm -hmm. Some of our bigger institutions have quite sophisticated setups um, and like to do a lot of work um, with that data locally, and, and that's kind of work that we can't really do um, at a sector level, but work that we try to enable them to do. Um, this all looks great and very fancy, but I just want to add a word of caution, and that Hello. is that this is incredibly complex to run. Um, I've been in the process of handing Hi, the ingest process yeah, over to a colleague, me? and it's we've spent quite a significant amount of time going through that. Okay. And Listen. that is because um, we oh, have a template, testing. and we and ask publishers to use I've our template, with, um, um, but probably only half good. of them do. Um, Hello. They use it Hello. in uh, a bit of a hit and Hello. miss way. Sometimes they use, don't use the fields quite as we intend. Um, sometimes Can they'll rename a tab inside the spreadsheet, which will break a workflow. Um, just very uh, basic Hello. things that can be quite difficult. Now, our template is based Hello. on the JISC um, template, um, which I would highly recommend if anyone's considering doing work in this area, because okay. um, we really cool. do need to get to a point where we've got some kind of standard, and I think no the JISC problem. is the best no at this point. But essentially, it's a two-part ingest process for any new publisher report. So some of them send the reports monthly, some send quarterly. The very small publishers may only send annually. So each time we receive a report, we have a workflow that looks like um, one of these. Um, and we will connect to a spreadsheet, uh, connect to our Snowflake database, and then run through this output. Now, there's lots of points here where things could go wrong. Um, yes. But uh, yes. for the most part, we're able to troubleshoot yes. that and keep Testing. these running. Two. Um, but we are very reliant on publishers one, two, either using our template or not changing their template in order to make one, this two, process three. run smoothly. Once the data has been ingested into that staging layer, we then run the second workflow, okay, which actually deals with all the Can publishers all at once. And this is a process where the data okay. gets um, transformed and moved across to our integration Testing layer, one, where two. it goes into a single um, data set that is then surfaced Hello. through Tableau Online. So it's a real two-step process. So this isn't part of a call statistics. Uh, it's part of the broader analytics service Hello. and runs alongside. Hello. But I would say that I probably spend um, a majority of my analytics time working on this as opposed to the call statistics. Okay, cool. The statistics uh, really run once a year. And then in between, um, there's uh, things that you do, you might update a number if someone's uh, figures out that they've made an error um, or it's administration of the Tableau um, dashboards um, or administration of Tableau accounts. Um, this is much, much more labor intensive. It is something that our members really appreciate. Um, they are constantly asking for more data. When can we get the latest data? Where, where is it up to? When are you loading more? Um, so it has been a significant value add for us. And I think um, it really has been an important part of the content procurement business as well, um, that we're able to help members get the data to justify the decisions, to trans, um, 
to trans, um, transform their agreements into read and publish agreements. So finally, I just wanted to share a few things. Um, I understand that um, potentially you might be in the early stages around um, this kind of work with benchmarking data in South Africa. And I, I wanted to share a few things that I've learned over the last um, couple of years. The first of those is that uh, is the importance of very clear and detailed descriptions of the statistics elements. Um, the short is not always better. Um, and I think it's important to learn over time um, what, uh, where, the, where the gaps are and what people's questions are going to be about those statistics elements. The next thing I would say is that we collect quite a lot of elements. Um, but we don't by any means collect everything that our members would like us to collect. So we don't, for example, uh, collect door count statistics anymore. Um, and that decision was taken before I started at call and maybe during the COVID period, that would have been a very interesting measure to be able to, to compare across. But when we did a review of the statistics elements in 2018, it was decided that not everyone needed that for benchmarking. So what we really focus on, uh, what do our members, what data do our members need at the sector level? What data do they need for benchmarking? Um, and that mightn't be number of seats or, um, you know, the things that we used to count in the past. So it's, it's important, you know, someone will ask us to, oh, why don't you collect this? Or can we, you know, can call collect this? Um, but at the end of the day, you don't want to blow out this data collection and entry process into, you know, a huge cumbersome pro process for institutions or it's just too hard for them to manage um, and and too uh, too burdensome to be managed on an ongoing basis um, so i think would say be very careful about the elements that you do select um, the other thing that i would say is that when you're designing a set of elements that you're going to collect or you're reviewing a set of elements that you're going to collect Coco. hello it's really Yumi. important to think about this as um you know a five one, to ten two. year set of elements we don't want to be changing these every Testing. year it's it, it just no, you no. lose the utility um of the data and it becomes very difficult to map elements to each other as i learned when i was doing that mapping no pre and post 2018. So when it, um, when it is time to define a set of elements or it's time to review a set of elements, um, you know, you want to be able to see this data over a significant period of time in order for it to have um, maximum usefulness. So we will be reviewing our <laughs> elements late next it's year no and then we will have to give members a significant amount of notice, um, probably a year, to allow them to adjust the way they uh, collect um, or what they're collecting and how they're going to oh, report good. it. Testing, um, and my intention will be to future proof that testing, as much testing. as possible um, and to really make sure that when we define those elements, they're going to last for at least five years um, so that we uh, capture a significant amount of data. Testing, one, two. I'd also suggest um, it's worth thinking about, guys, does every no element more. need to be collected every year? Um, is there some data I can that hear can be collected from the venue, um, but either through the a different process just um, on a different um, cadence? So for example, yeah, last no year we ran anymore, an equity, diversity and inclusion survey. We yeah, won't look at those measures audio. every year. We it's might do that survey chat. again in five years. This is what I did. I and we worked really guys. hard on the instrument with the intention and that we would be able to use that survey yeah. instrument again. Right. We also do a salary survey for the directors of university libraries. And that's yeah. something that we used to do annually. Um, and then I suggested that maybe we could do that um, uh, biennially instead, that it wasn't necessarily something we needed to collect every year. So thinking about that frequency of data collection is also very important. In terms of our specific elements, if you are to go and have a look at these, I want to highlight a couple of things that I definitely wouldn't do the way we are doing now. Um, and that is uh, the title holdings for books digital and the title holdings for journals digital. These are incredibly problematic um, because different libraries uh, have different systems and count the data I count the titles differently. Um, and probably the most revealing thing that I can see is that when we look at the institution's um, expenditure on electronic books versus their holdings on electronic books, 
the top 10 institutions for expenditure are not the same as the top 10 institutions for holdings. So we know there's a mismatch there and it is around the different systems and the way different systems output this data. In fact, I would even question whether title holdings is a valid measure anymore. What is a title? Um, in the digital age and how do we define the things that we're counting? I think um, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. I would also say that um, we do need to review the elements that we are collecting for um, open access repo uh, for repositories. Um, we currently uh, have three elements. Um, we count the number of outputs total. We count the number of outputs um, and that, that includes both records where there is an, the full text attached and not the full text attached. Then we count the metadata only records where there's no full text attached. And then we have a usage statistic as well. And I think these, these outputs and metadata only records um, need some review as well. But there are certainly other areas where we can tighten up our definitions and make things easier for people as they collect data. Finally, I would just say, if you are setting up this kind of um, process or system locally, I would be very wary about custom database builds uh, and custom front-end data entry tools. Um, I think what we have put together in terms of our stack is fit for purpose, is a lot cheaper to maintain and run than having to have database people on staff. And it means that we can just be a little bit more agile. Um, and certainly when you have a custom bespoke um, database set up, it can cause problems with upgrades and, and things like that. So I think that is um, certainly something to bear in mind. There is information about the call analytics service, um, particularly the statistics service and the statistics data set on our website. It's buried under services and programs and statistics services. We are about to have a website redevelopment project, which is very exciting. Um, and it will tell you a bit about our, um, our processes and how much things cost. Um, you'll also see there that up till 2020, you can download our statistics data in um, Excel spreadsheets. Uh, a decision was taken in kind of the mid 2010s yes, to do. make our data publicly accessible. So no embargo. Oh, can you it. hear me? And we know that it is used by um, people can across the higher me? education Testing, and library you? sectors. Um, and so this allows um, anybody to download the data. Now we haven't um, got the 2021 data up yet because Testing. we haven't yet ingested the One, two, 2021 population two. data. The government was running quite behind with that. Can you um, hear me? And so that will be there shortly. You can also see the instructions oh. um, for the 2022 okay, cool. data collection um, period. So, the virtual um, so we're always running in arrears. We like currently have our 2022 data and collection open. Just it closes next him. Wednesday. Uh, um, and there's a little bit of history with there about on the, whole, the audio. Um, data set as well. Cool. You are very welcome to contact me. I'm happy to take questions now, but you're also welcome to contact me um, afterwards. Um, I will say I'm about to go on parental leave and I do have a colleague here with me tonight, Katja Henry, who will be stepping into my role um, from next Thursday um, and Katja will be around to answer questions as well. So thanks very much for having me. Happy to take questions. Um, I did have a little bit of trouble hearing the microphone in the room, so we might have to just um, work with that. Um, but uh, yeah, over to you. And just to note that the room is muted at the moment, so we can't hear anything. We can't hear. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, we can't hear anything from the room. Very faint. I have just put a message in the chat. Unfortunately, we can't hear anything from the room. Sure, we are going to sort that out shortly. Thank you. One thing I can say whilst you are thinking, 
can you see the resource allocation required here? It's not of the calf thing that you have to just say, well, go in this way. You have to be clear and how you're going to fund this uh, tool. Nothing from the directors? Disappointing, Anke? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Kit. I want to find out if there's some level of collaboration with um, uh, offices such as uh, of the university research offices, even when you drew reports of your elements. Yeah, that's a good question. So when we um, come to the time that we review the elements, which will be hopefully late next year, we will put together a reference group. Um, I have an analytics, analytics portfolio working group at the moment who worked on the, the development of the new stack. Um, we will have a reference group um, of member institution staff um, and it will be we will be relying on them to have those conversations locally um, around with their research officers, with their liaison librarians and their research librarians around what the what the numbers are that they need to get. Um, we do know that the libraries are feeding the read and publish data through to the research officers as well. And that that's been an important um, input for them uh, in terms of Sorry, reporting. Kate. So sorry, they can't hear you in the venue. Please give us one second. Okay. Kate, can you can you respond again? We didn't hear you this time. Yes, we'll do. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yes, when, whenever we do anything at call, we always put together um, reference groups and project teams of member institution staff. Um, and those are staff in the libraries at um, our member institutions, and we rely Hi, on Kate, them to have conversations with their Good, thank you. Um, research you? officers, their liaison and research librarians, um, and to make sure that um, the changes, any changes that we're proposing are going to work for those other areas of the business. So yes, oh. there will be consultation through those processes. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Katie, for the insightful presentation around statistics. My question is around um, funding. So um, you did, uh, we as uh, South Africans also need to look at funding models. Uh, can you give very briefly um, the funding and perhaps an estimation? I know you wouldn't divulge the exact uh, funding um, models, but just an estimation of what in, in the initial cost was? Um, that's a very good question. And it's one I can only partially answer because um, we've been collecting statistics for so long that really uh, the project where we brought this in-house was very much a technology project. It wasn't that we didn't have to deal with any of the costs around um, defining the elements or doing that um, collaboration and consultation work to define what the elements are. Um, it's not an overly expensive solution. And certainly if you had the expertise of member institution staff to draw on, you could make it happen a lot um, more cheaply. Um, I think um, you'd be looking at in the vicinity of, uh, I, oh, I'm trying to remember what we, what we paid for the um, statistic solution. Um, I think, you know, a Tableau online instance, you'd be probably looking at about $20,000 Australian a year. Um, and then the uh, Snowflake data, data, uh, data warehouse, the costs are fairly low for that, probably a couple of thousand a year, um, because we're using it uh, in that way where we're having extracts connect. Um, once you've got a Tableau online instance using Tableau desktop and Tableau prep, um, have no costs associated with them. The most significant cost really is staff time in terms of um, running the processes. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have some administrative support around collecting the data, but most of um, that work sits with me. Um, and yeah, so really staff costs are probably your most significant expense. Thank you. 
thank you, thank you, Dr. Kate, for your presentation. In your presentation, you have also mentioned that you are collecting population data, i.e., from the government and for from the institution. What I would like to know is if you are in collaboration with the government and what kind of the data you are collecting from the government and also from the institution. When you are referring to collection of data from the institution, um, also I would also want to know how do you treat the Copia Act with regard to the institutions with the data collection. Thank you. So the government data. Um, we're very fortunate in Australia that they collect um, student numbers and staff numbers for institutions and they publish that data online. Um, there are some specific views of that data that we need that aren't part of the main data set. Um, and it's as simple as um, we email them and they generally will send us a spreadsheet of the data we need. Um, and it only costs us, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars. Um, at most a year to, to get that. One of the complicating factors, of course, is we're running across two countries. So we have to deal with both the New Zealand government and the Australian government. In terms of the member institutions, I have one statistics contact um, who will shortly be re renamed an analytics coordinator at each institution. And it's their responsibility to manage the collection um, and uh, the collection of uh, the data locally and then to input that data into the system for us. And um, they tend to be very diligent. I just checked today, we've got 42 of the 48 institutions have um, submitted their data uh, just about a week ahead of, of time. Um, and so they uh, negotiate all the local processes that need to be in place in order to get that data. They get the counter reports and so forth, and they work with other areas of the institution, pull data for the library management system and various other places. Thank you. Well, how we sent up the time? I think it's now going for nine o'clock for you there in Australia at night. You are missing your supper with family. Yes, Dr. Benny. Uh, colleagues online, I don't see anything. If there's nothing in the next two minutes, I'm going to cut you off. Well, thank you, Dr. Davis, for such a insightful presentation. Uh, I have a question with regard to data sets on uh, transmission agreements. I just want to establish something in terms of uh, what kind of data patterns are imaging out of such a data set, especially with regard to update, update as well as um, Cost avoidance to pay member institution. And also, if you can just point out in terms of level of competition, that is imaging out of that data amongst those participating member institutions. Thank you. So, I had a little bit of trouble hearing, but I think. Yes. Sorry, was okay. somebody saying something? About the pattern that's imaging amongst the, the institutions in core with regards to transformative agreements. Ah. What is the pattern? Um, that's a good question. The, the, I guess there's a pattern of acceptance of the agreements and then there's the pattern of, um, of the, the publishing patterns, which, which do really vary. I guess we've only been collecting and providing access to this data for a year. Um, so I've been reluctant to do a lot of trend analysis at this stage. I think what we have learned this year is that um, uh, at, with the addition of some new larger agreements is that publishing um, volumes really do vary and I'm hesitant to provide to to do much trend analysis on the 2022 um, data because I think what we saw in 21 and 22 were peaks in publishing post-COVID um, and I suspect we're about to see a bit of a downward trend in, in publishing in general. Um, we're starting to see that, that come through in, in some of the uh, expenditure of capped agreements. Um, so we're, we're keeping an eye on it, but it's not something that we're kind of ready to draw conclusions on. I think we probably need a good, um, I mean, I'd really like to start working on that after two years, um, having two years of solid data there to work with. Um, but we do know anecdotally that the researchers love it. 
Um, they are incredibly happy to be able to publish their articles APC free. We get um, uh, on Twitter posts all the time um, acknowledging uh, a new publication and um, thanking Call for negotiating the agreements. Um, and so it's been um, it's been an interesting process to watch that that author acceptance and and see. Um, I'm very keen to do some qualitative work as well around um, author perceptions of open access and the impact of read and publish agreements on those perceptions. So that's a piece of work we'd like to do in the not too distant future as well. Thank you for that. Uh, any questions online? Uh, the UJ colleagues, Nomoya and the team, you are instrumental in the task team. Are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, really, thank you for the presentation. Um, what, I, what I'm noting personally from the presentation is that here in SA, we are really on the right track in what we are currently doing with regards to um, setting up such a database for SA. And from the presentation, it is very clear that I can say just in terms of the current statistics um, group that uh, is, is looking at um, uh, statistics uh, in our academic libraries at the moment. I think when the time comes for um, SA libraries to embark on such a database, we will really be very helpful in uh, making sure that uh, the data that is required for such a database would be easily um, uh, sort of uh, sourced and also sort of negotiated and good engagement will happen amongst librarians. And I think this group will really play a good role in facilitating such um, so that uh, the database becomes a success. I really thank you for inviting us. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Um, no and more. as that project I'm representing the entire team. Uh, so I'm looking at the time, Dr. Katie, there's no comments from the directors here, which is a concern from us. But in any case, thank you very much for your time. And the fact that you are going on maternity leave and that uh, Dr. Henry will be taking over uh, when you are on maternity leave. We wish you all the best. And then we thank you for skipping your family time for dinner to be with, with, with us here. And uh, thank you very much. And then well done. Thank you, colleagues who Thanks are online, and we'll see you when we have to do the investigation around what we need to be doing with regards to what Nomoya highlighted and what we heard from uh, what the what the coal colleagues are doing. It's quite inventive, and we can gain a lot from that one. Thank you very much, Dr. Katie. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. And thank you very much.